The 3rd of February, 1947, Hamburg, Germany. The former staff of Ravensbrück, the largest concentration camp for women in Nazi Germany, hears their sentences read. After almost two months of gruesome testimonies, the world finally learns the truth about the inhumane mistreatment and torture conducted by the camp's male and female personnel during its six-year existence. Out of 16 defendants, 11 are sentenced to death by hanging. One of them is Carmen Mori. Carmen Maria Mori was born on the 2nd of July, 1906, in Bern, Switzerland. Her father was a doctor by profession and opened a private medical practice in a famous Swiss spa town of Adelborden, which was visited by a number of very influential and wealthy people. Thanks to spa guests from all over the world, Carmen learned several foreign languages. She attended a private boarding school in Switzerland and in the UK, and then travelled around Europe. She had a complicated relationship with her father, who described his daughter as a liar, intriguer, and schemer with a defective sense of ethics. Young Carmen, on one occasion, told her friends that she wanted to live her life to the fullest and enjoy the company of men, not one but many. She had, however, one rule, no Jews. In 1928, she began studying singing and music in Munich, but dropped out in 1932. Her dream of becoming a singer was dashed as she was diagnosed with chronic tonsillitis and had to undergo surgery, which ultimately ended her singing career. She then moved to Berlin and started to work as an independent journalist. On the 30th of January, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany by the German president, Paul von Hindenburg. The Nazi regime quickly began to restrict the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and gradually excluded them from professions, businesses, and public spaces. Nazi propaganda became inescapable in Germany. Josef Goebbels, head of the new propaganda ministry, who allegedly shared an intimate relationship with Carmen Mori, created a cult of personality that glorified Hitler as Germany's infallible savior. The Nazis effectively used propaganda, which dominated the press, film, radio, and public spaces to win the support of millions of Germans to facilitate persecution, war, and ultimately genocide. Carmen became immediately attracted to the power of the Nazis and became interested in the Nazi ideology. In 1934, thanks to her contacts among the Nazi officials and her language skills, she began to work as an undercover agent for the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police. In 1937, she was sent to Paris to collect information on the Maginot Line, which was a line of concrete fortifications, obstacles, and weapon installations built by France in the 1930s to protect its border with Germany. In addition, Mori spied on various German immigrants, including Max Braun, a politician who the Gestapo believed was secretly smuggling Jews out of Germany. World War II started on the 1st of September, 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. The German invasion of France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands started on the 10th of May, 1940, and became known as the Battle of France. On the 6th of June 1940, less than three weeks before the fall of France, Maury, who in November 1938 had been arrested in Paris and sentenced to death for espionage, was under mysterious circumstances pardoned by French President Albert Lebrun. It is believed that she became a double agent and for the French Secret Service she was supposed to collect information about German agents in France. On the 14th of June 1940, Paris, the French capital, fell to the Germans. Having lost the trust of her superiors in the Gestapo, Carmen Mori was arrested by German authorities and taken to the Alexanderplatz prison in Berlin for interrogation. However, she used her powers of persuasion to gain freedom, and within a few weeks, she was back on the streets of Berlin. In the meantime, however, many of her friends turned their back on her, as she was viewed by many as an international swindler and thief. Recognizing that she was a persona non grata, she applied for a German passport so that she could return to her native Switzerland, where she hoped nobody would know her past. Almost immediately, she was caught and brought to the feared SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich, who during the 1942 Wannsee Conference outlined the implementation of the Final Solution, which was the systematic extermination of European Jews. At first, he was highly suspicious of Carmen, but in the end, he proved seducible and granted her freedom when Carmen Mori assured him she would never again leave Germany. Four months later, however, Carmen Mori walked into the Swiss embassy and demanded a Swiss passport. Gestapo agents captured her on the spot, 
and on the 26th of February, 1941, by the order of Reinhard Heydrich, Carmen Mori was transported to the Ravensbrück concentration camp for women. Ravensbrück, opened in May 1939, was the only major women's camp established by the Nazis. The Ravensbrück camp was staffed both by SS men, who served as guards and administrators, and by 150 women, who served as supervisors. These female supervisors were either SS volunteers or women who had taken the job for the good pay and working conditions. Ravensbrück also housed a training camp for female SS guards, who were taught by Dorothea Binz, the sadistically cruel German Nazi officer and supervisor, who instructed her trainees on how to handle the prisoners that they were going to supervise. These prisoners would have to work until they died, and the task of their supervisors was to get the maximum amount of work out of them whilst they were still alive. Ravensbrück thus also became a training center or a school of violence for about 3,500 female guards who went on to serve either there or at other concentration camps. Starting in the summer of 1942, SS medical doctors subjected prisoners at Ravensbrück to unethical medical experiments. They often used a hammer to break legs of female prisoners, then infected open wounds with aggressive bacteria, and monitored the healing with and without various chemical substances such as sulfonamide, which was an early antibiotic to prevent infections. Believing it could help in treating amputee soldiers, they also tested various methods of setting and transplanting bones. Such experiments included amputations and were often performed without any anesthesia. These experiments were conducted in Block 10, of which Carmen Mori would soon become a capo. The capos were prisoners in Nazi camps who were selected by the SS to supervise the other camp inmates. The capos received better food, clothing, and housing, and had a reputation of brutal supervisors, beating, denouncing, and even killing their fellow prisoners. Block 10 had a section for the mentally ill and people who were infected with tuberculosis, and according to several testimonies, Carmen treated these prisoners like animals. She kept many inmates virtually unclothed, beaten and bloody. It was only when the selection lorry halted outside Block 10 that the full horror of how the patients were treated became apparent. The poor victims could not even take their rags with them on the journey to the gas chamber. These would be stripped from them in front of the lorry, and with a swift kick, the women were loaded inside. Carmen Mori was a tormentor of the sick, and it was she who completely deprived the mentally ill of their food rations and robbed other sick women until they were left with a bare minimum. Carmen Mori was also described as a sadomasochistic psychopath and a sexually voracious woman. She maintained an intimate relationship with a fellow Swiss medical student named Anne Spori, who was known in the camp as Dr. Claude. Mori was referred to as the Black Angel of Ravensbrück, and together with her lover Arne Spori, they would often beat patients, especially the mentally ill. After the war, one Ravensbrück survivor testified that Spori and Mori regularly threw buckets of cold water over the 65 occupants of the lunatic room. Mori also participated in selections of unworthy patients for the gas chamber, and committed murder herself in at least 60 cases by giving them lethal injections. In total, some 132,000 women from all over Europe passed through the camp, including Poles, Russians, Jews, Gypsies, and others. Of that number, over 92,000 women perished. When the camp was liberated by the Red Army on the 30th of April, 1945, there were about 3,500 sick women, men, and children in the camp. After the end of the war, Carmen Mori was released from the camp, and by September 1945, she was engaged to a British officer and working at the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. But when the British learned that Mori's Block 10 activities were not as she had described, she was seized and accused of multiple murders. Justice finally caught up with Mori when she was tried at the first Ravensbrück trial, which began on the 5th of December, 1946. Together with 15 other defendants, she was accused of joint responsibility for and participation in the crimes committed at Ravensbrück. During the trial, Mori, dressed in a dark fur coat, received significant negative coverage in the press, having been described as the monster or a third-rate Mata Hari. Numerous Ravensbrück survivors gave testimonies against Mori, and Hans Mori, her former comrade from Ravensbrück, did not contest any of the statements, saying that she had been bewitched. On the 3rd of February, 1947, the British Military Tribunal sentenced Carmen Mori to death by hanging. As she was sentenced to death, Mori surveyed the courtroom with an apparent insouciance and theatrically made the sign of the cross. 
On the 9th of April, 1947, before the execution could be carried out, Mori, then 40 years old, committed suicide by slashing her wrists with a razor hidden inside her shoe. When the guards finally discovered her corpse, she was surrounded by dozens of items of her clothing, including her fox fur, much like an actress's discarded costume, after the final act. There were no tears shed for Carmen Mori. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.